My name's Tony Jinks, I'm acting president of AIP Arts at the moment, so I'm sort of acting as the host MC for today. And if I cast my mind, just a quick introduction before we start with our talks, if I cast my mind back to the first time I was associated with a talk such as this run by AIPR, we held it at Parramatta campus of what would be UWS, one dark and stormy night during the middle of the week, and I remember the parking was horrific, it was pitch black, the rain was pelting down, and no one knew where building EV was. When I finally accessed it, we found this strange little lecture theatre up the top, like three stories up, and I spent the whole time worrying that the security people would lock us in and uh, we'd be stuck there all night. So it was quite a, there was one talk, it was quite a, a new thing for us to do. Since then, uh, last year was the first time we actually started to expand the AIPR talk. We had four speakers rather than one, and we did it on a Saturday rather than a, a midweek at, at UWS. We did it at the Harbour, Harbour View Hotel, which is in North Sydney, down road here. And it was really good. The only problem we had was that the room was so long and narrow that if you came in and got the last seats, you could hardly hear the speakers. So all of a sudden, for this year, we have six speakers and we have a wonderful room, open and airy, and I think we're just getting there. And I think we're going to see some big things in the future with the AIPR mini conference, and I think it starts today. We've got, we've got six wonderful speakers, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first one. This, the, the topics we have today are very diverse, and exploring different types of or different areas of parapsychology and also the connections between parapsychology and other aspects of the paranormal. And that's where Bill Chalker comes in. Now Bill is a renowned ufologist and if you haven't any of Bill's books on your bookshelf, I suggest straight after this conference you go out and rectify that because I have many of Bill's books on my bookshelf and he's a great author and a fascinating uh, resource for ufology. Where does ufology fit into parapsychology? Well, that's what we're going to find out today because Bill's talk is all about the, the role, the, the connection between ufology, the study of UFOs and unidentified flying objects, and parapsychology itself. So on that note, I introduce our first speaker, Bill Chalker. Hi, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, is somebody going to operate the PowerPoint or do I need to operate it? as well. Uh, it's not a subset of that field either, but it's, it, it's really, I, I've been exposed to this field for a long, long time. Go to the next slide. And part of this background will highlight the fact that uh, particularly since the early 70s and my time at Macquarie University while I was doing a science degree, uh, majoring in chemistry and mathematics, I was exposed to both UFOs and parapsychology. Uh, in fact, I was Chairman of the uh, fledgling Ghost and oh, well, the fledgling University of New England uh, Psychic Phenomena Research Society, and I was their uh, seconded um, chairman of the Ghost and Topic Guide subcommittee, mainly because at that early stage in the 70s, UFOs weren't even on the parapsychology horizon. Basically, it was kind of one of those things that they kept at arm's length, you know, almost as equivalent to demonology, that kind of thing. It just wasn't 
something that was being readily admitted into the parapsychology field. Um, things are kind of changing, and I think a lot of researchers are seeing that there are substantial benefits for actually some form of cooperation between two fields because if you're looking for a, uh, a psychic subject, um, that kind of thing, that, uh, an individual or a situation has lots of paranormal kind of aspects to it, you can't go past ufology because uh, a lot of UFO witnesses, particularly in close encounter cases and so-called abduction cases, uh, the paranormal elements of it are quite profound and often quite complex, but the message that I'd like you to take home is that it's not the be-all and end-all of, of the, uh, those sort of encounters. There is an incredibly substantial uh, physical solid aspect to it as well. It's almost like a duality going on. Like it's partly physical and partly what we might deem by current Stevens a um, paranormal aspect. Um, can you go on to the next thing? Now my initiation into UFOs and the paranormal and all that kind of stuff really came through a lot of the pages of things like the Flying Saucer Review, a classic magazine of the early era. It first started being published in the 1950s. And by the early 1970s, it was really the go-to magazine in terms of getting a substantial take on the physical aspects of the UFO phenomenon, but also the possible paranormal, um, parapsychological dimensions of it. And this issue here uh, came out in 1973, had Yuri Geller on the cover, and even people in Flying Social Review or MSR thought that he was kind of the key to it, but really it was uh, a pretty controversial key to say the, say the least. And that issue was actually the first issue that I had an article in Flying Source Review as well, which was kind of like a close encounter with a, I guess, for want of a better word, a, a min type uh, object, etc. It was a really intriguing case. Next. Um, but at the same time, I was being exposed to a lot of the paranormal, that kind of stuff, and Certainly, uh, guys like Dr. Indra Baharic, um, when he wrote the so-called authorised autobiography of Yuri Geller, um, that just escalated the whole sort of uh, situation to a, uh, an unbelievable degree because he kind of did the impossible. He created a book that was so bizarre and so, so strange that parapsychologists largely ignored it and UFO researchers largely ignored it, and yet he was, Baharic, saying that Yuri Geller's powers were created or caused by extraterrestrial beings. Uh, but the reason why the UFO field tended to avoid this book as well was that the UFO entities were completely unprecedented. They were almost science fiction in nature. They were beings called from the mine, uh, Rhombus 4D, Hoover, uh, all, all these sort of bizarre, almost science fiction type names. But there were some astute researchers like Colin Wilson, who saw uh, the situation between Indrao Paharic and Geller as almost like a, a psychic explosion. When those two guys came together, uh, everything escalated. And it was really quite bizarre. And, and some people, like, like Colin Wilson, viewed it as like a, a cosmic kind of public ice explosion. Now, um, but it, it kind of bubbled away and, and largely seemingly is ignored. But if you really want to a, uh, a trip through ultimate weirdness. Read Baharic's book on Yuri Geller. It's it's a fascinating read, but it's, I warn you now, it's a pretty heavy game. Um, at the same time, uh, cautionary tales were being expressed in uh, books by Matthew Many, who was a young psychic, but no UFO connection whatsoever with, with, with Matthew Many. He was one of, like Yuri Geller, heavily tested um, and um, he spent more time in the laboratory than Geller did, but uh, there were no UFO aspects to it. It was just a classic kind of ghost, kind of haunting kind of situation. Um, he now pretty much doesn't sort of uh, um, show up too often in terms of uh, psychic type gifts and things like that. He's done things like healing and that kind of thing. Um, so, two interesting individuals and a third one that complicated the, the picture no end. Next. Now, one of the magazines that was exposed to me by Dr. John Kennedy, who was the first president of the University of New England uh, Psychic Research Society, was Psychic Magazine coming out of California. Now, 
this was doing a, an interesting kind of job because it was exposing, uh, I guess, the psychic research field to the whole broad spectrum of what was going on during the 70s. And they were introducing the field to people like Andrea Pahari, Yuri Geller, all sorts of people. And for the first time, certainly by about 1973-74, they were exposing the psychic field to the psychic connection in the uh, UFO phenomenon. And that was happening courtesy of uh, Jacques Vallée. Next slide. Jacques Vallée, in 1975, brought a lot of this stuff together and came out with a book called The Invisible College. And uh, it was highlighting how um, those scientists and others that were um, examining the UFO phenomenon, mainly under the radar, so to speak, not the very public light, were encountering not only really extraordinary physical evidence for UFOs, but they were also encountering uh, cases that were deep in paranormal dimensions. And some might say that the book was published in the paperback form and was retitled UFOs for Psychic Connection. This is Jacques Lee actually giving a presentation uh, to the French equivalent of NASA last year uh, in Paris. Um, so he's still around in the field and um, trying to plug the science of it, and, but also trying to plug the, the paranormal dimensions a little. Next. <coughs> now, in 1975, there was uh, one book that came out courtesy of uh, Jerome Clark, a good friend of mine, and Warren Coleman, who is very big for a long, long time in the cryptozoology field. And I'm sure Paul uh, Crock will be able to figure in on, on Warren Coleman. Now that book was called The Unidentified, Most Towards Solving the UFO Mystery. Now as I said here, this is Jerry Clark's own take on his own book, uh, uh, with the benefit of hindsight. He said, a largely forgotten obsession of 1970s ufology. I know it well. In 1975, Warren Coleman and I wrote a book, The Unidentified, which captured the spirit of the era, Jungian theories and parapsychological UFOs. Coleman and I soon moved on relegating the book to youthful excess and embarrassed recall. In other words, they kind of dissociated themselves from this. They felt it was kind of way over the top and, and really uh, um, they felt that they were kind of glossing over a lot of the, the hardcore physical aspects of the UFO phenomenon and kind of really denying all that and, and just looking at it as a kind of a, um, I guess, a, a cosmic archetype being depicted on the world at large. So, Next. Now, paranormal or parapsychological explanations for UFOs largely slipped under the radar and didn't get a great deal of substance until this year. Um, and, and this book here, Illuminations, the UFO experience as a parapsychological event that's kind of reignited the whole debate and controversy. Um, now, as I go through this, you'll probably get my kind of opinion about this book coming out fairly loud and clear. But um, the chap involved that's doing this is Dr. Eric Lutt, who is a, um, a defence scientist based in Toronto. Um, and he's been a long time uh, parapsychological researcher. Uh, but he comes at it from a sociological point of view as well. And he's sort of trying to um, uh, overlay what he felt was the best fit explanation available, not only with the benefit of, uh, of the past, uh, with books like Jerry Clark's book and uh, Lauren Coleman's book uh, and other sort of paranormal takes on the UFO subject, and works like Jacques Vallée and John Keel, um, even Carl Jung's book, Flying Sources, trying to incorporate all those things together but with the overlay of very current kind of thinking about the paranormal. Now, uh, is it a success? Uh, in one word, I'd say no. But nevertheless, it's a really interesting kind of uh, uh, take on it. And I think it's kind of a wake-up call to both fields that there's something of substantial interest in both subjects that overlap all the time. And there's benefit. Uh, to really examine each of these areas very, very carefully because uh, uh, each field misses out on so much if they don't do that. Uh, but at the same time, 
uh, it's a bit of a problem when explanatory models are put forward that really don't um, look at the phenomena in a, in a highly detailed way and don't satisfactorily explain everything. Next. Now, Goulet, what he's done in the book Illuminations is to apply a model, a theoretical model, I stress theoretical model because it's far from proven, um, and this is the uh, theory of pragmatic information. Now, this was um, the older model of uh, pragmatic information. It's often summarised as MPI. Uh, each field has their own terminology and their own abbreviations that drives researchers mad trying to keep up with it. But essentially, um, Lillet took the work of a um, quantum physicist who's had an extensive career in paranormal and psychic research by the name of Walter von Lockerbu. Now, this theory is quite complicated because it, it owes its origins substantially to a, a paranormal, or sorry, a, 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 a quantum physical take on the, on the uh, paranormal phenomena. And what, this, what he's trying to do there is to look at things like entanglement, uh, this fairly difficult concept to get around. It's uh, Einstein referred to entanglement as uh, spooky effects at a distance. So it, it fits in really well with the paranormal and bizarre things that go on in the UFO field as well, where you can't explain it. So why not try entanglement? Because a lot of people don't understand entanglement. A lot of quantum physicists don't readily understand, or they certainly disagree with each other in terms of what entanglement means. But uh, basically, I guess from the paranormal field, think about it. Uh, in terms of spooky effects, right? X-Files type stuff that cannot be rationally explained by current day physics. Now, quantum physics is a helpful, or sometimes not so helpful, um, kind of model to try and provide some sense of maybe there's an explanation in quantum mechanics. Now, maybe there is, maybe there's not, but it's our best model, I suppose, <coughs> at the moment to try and real, deal with this really weird stuff. Now, with Von Lockerdu, he looked at principally uh, the era of paranormal that has some of the most substantial physical effects or observable physical effects. And Paul Proper and Tony Healy will give you a really uh, great sort of introduction to the uh, poltergeist field. And that's where Von Lockerdu focuses. He applies these uh, obvious expertise in quantum physics um, to the field of poltergeist, or uh, using the term RSPK, uh, sort of recurrent spontaneous uh, psychokinesis. Uh, and here in the poltergeist field, it, there is, uh, the one thing that stands out is that you're getting massive displays of physical objects being displaced, uh, things flying around rooms, all that kind of stuff, you know, the classic kind of poltergeist, uh, often referred to in the past as noisy spirits. Um, can we get the next one? Now, here's one of Von Lockerdu's early papers on this synchronistic phenomena as entanglement correlations in generalised quantum theory. Um, it, it's a fairly difficult paper to get through if you had no exposure to quantum physics. He says he has a helpful appendix at the end, but it's, uh, if you haven't had any exposure to quantum mechanics, it's heavy going. Uh, and I've, I've had exposure to quantum mechanics, so, and I found it heavy going. But it's kind of, it's uh, a lot of it is available, and the thing you have to remember is that a lot of this stuff in quantum mechanics hasn't been proven. It's still a theory. And entanglement is still a convenient term applied to unexplained phenomena that's observed in the quantum uh, level of reality. Now, the, quick, the problem is that all this entanglement is applied to the microscopic level, the quantum world. And what uh, Lakadu tends to try and do is to apply this to what's called generalised quantum theory, which is an attempt to extrapolate quantum theory to the macro world, the world that you and I experience, that kind of thing. This is where it starts to get pretty wobbly. If it wasn't already wobbly in the micro world, it becomes fairly difficult to verify and to prove in the macro world our normal day-to-day -day reality and I guess our so-called X-Files reality as well. 
Now, as I said, RSPK, current spontaneous psychokinesis is at the heart of what uh, Bon Locker do and the school there in illuminations are all about. I'm trying to focus on uh, large physical effects uh, that are reported. First of all, the ultraviolet realm. Next. Now, one of the problems is that with poltergeist, there's this recurring, well, the, the current state of play is that most uh, parapsychologists uh, ignore the classic kind of um, explanation of poltergeist, noisy spirits, or discarnate entities, that kind of stuff, as an explanation for poltergeist type cases. They, they look at it as, from the point of view of the, I guess, the pubescent folk like person, uh, or whatever as the cause, uh, but still, it's still not a perfect explanation that doesn't explain how it happens. It, clearly, there's a focus uh, in a lot of cases, but there, there is quite a large variety in poltergeist, which Paul and Tony will get into. But uh, one of the big problems and the biggest, one, some of the big issues in terms of Goulet's explanation for the UFO field uh, in his book Illuminations is that he, he largely ignores the big problem and this is that there is a big entity problem in the UFO field. There are literally thousands of reports of entities. Uh, what, entities that appear to be flesh and blood, uh, entities that appear to be paranormal, uh, really quite weird cases. And there's been a terrific amount of literature, as you can see here, written about the entity problem with regard to the UFO field. So th that's one of the first pitfalls that Dulet doesn't even really engage with. Uh, what about the entity problem in the UFO field? Uh, I guess it's easy to um, avoid it when you're just dealing with poltergeist because there's no kind of um, indication that you've got uh, little grey creatures and whatever wandering around uh, inflicting poltergeist on everybody at their beck and call. Uh, so that, that's pitfall number one. Uh, it's not explained by Ouellette's model or theory. Next. Uh, now, one would have thought if he's dealing with a model that has its origins, and this is the MPI model, the model of pragmatic information courtesy of Bob Wakadu, you would think he would look at UFO cases that are rich in poltergeist dimensions, but no, he doesn't. He literally ignores most of that. He gives lip service to a classic case that I'll touch on briefly in a moment, but there are cases that in the UFO field that have um, Poltergeist dimensions. So one of the classic ones was told to me by local radio identity uh, Ian McRae, who uh, was very popular in the 70s and 80s. Uh, he's still doing his radio shows now on various sort of channels. But he, he made me aware of the fact at the time that he, he was doing interviews for 2SM at the time and interviewing psychics, UFO uh, personalities, all that kind of stuff, and doing a really interesting kind of thing. It was kind of appealing to the rock format. Uh, rock music format, and he would be doing all these paranormal interviews and UFO interviews. And he told me about his interview with a, a, a English woman called Joyce Bowles, who was the main person involved in a quite extraordinary series of close encounter cases that was taking place during 1976 and 77 in England. Um, and uh, they were various called the Winchester encounters. And the problem with these is that it, it wasn't easy to dismiss this as a hallucination or a hoax because there were witnesses. Um, very striking place in counter cases. I won't go into any detail, but it was a pretty interesting case. But the, the big thing about this is that when Ian McRae went to the trouble of going to England, with his producer, Trevor um, Johnson, and they interviewed Joyce Bowles, but during their interview, um, she was highlighting the fact that she uh, had a strong psychic background as well. She was a healer. Uh, and all sorts of poltergeist phenomena and woody, classic pointing phenomena going on in her house. Um, and even while Ian McRae and Trevor Johnson were with her, she was demonstrating uh, the big deal in that day, of that period, was bending spoons and things like that. Uh, she would be bending spoons and forks, that kind of stuff, in the presence of Ian and, and his producer. And um, they saw a, a bulb uh, fly across the room, um, they also, uh, Trevor Johnson, um, sat beside Joyce Bowles and while she put her hand on his leg and he, she, he felt warmth, um, there was um, 
he held a, a spoon in his hand and he was able to bend a spoon while she had the, her hand on his leg. So that blew Trevor's mind, it blew Liam's mind, and straight away he told me about this and he gave me all the details of the interviews at, at that time. I wrote an article for it in a little magazine called Psychic Australian that was coming out at the time. So here was a case that had very extraordinary UFO connections, but it also had this overlay of extensive paranormal connections as well. The so next. Um, now, in Paul and Tony's book, which you'll hear about this afternoon in great detail, um, there was a classic case, one of the best cases of poltergeist uh, in Australia at, at uh, Minyanup in Western Australia during the late 1950s. Now that area, uh, particularly a little location about a kilometre or two down the road, Boyup Brook, in 1967 became the centre of some really striking UFO encounters. One that we learnt about fairly early, which involved a classic UFO shining down what I'm really fascinated by, particularly these days, uh, solid light, where there's this projection of light that we don't, it, it doesn't behave in the way that we understand light. It projected down slowly onto the car that was driving along at about 50 to 70 miles per hour, and uh, the beam came down to the windscreen and all the electric stopped, and it was, it, it had a period of missing time. Uh, and a really striking case that was investigated not only by police and civilian investigators, but by the RWF and all the rest of it. They couldn't explain it. Uh, what wasn't known and didn't come out until one of the family members um, wrote a memoir about the 1950s Holtkeis Act outbreak. Uh, Helen Hack, wasn't it? Yeah. She was a family member married into the family. And none of this would have come out without that connection. And what she highlighted was that there was a farmer on the same night as this encounter, within a kilometre, who experienced um, great disturbance, um, uh, woke up, uh, the dogs were going berserk, he goes out and straight away he's hit with this really startling gleam of light that seemed to make his hand transparent, it really freaked him out, you know, looked at it you could see through his hand. So it was a really strange case and there were other events, but even back in the classic late 1950s with this classic poltergeist case, and I'm talking classic here, there was a stone throwing poltergeist with showers of stones that, and it was spread over a number of different properties. Throughout that there was this interesting uh, background of sightings of strange walls of light, like the classic min min lights, that kind of stuff. All that was happening at the same time. So a really interesting kind of situation. But none of this gets exposed in Ulet's book, he, he, does, he's not, he doesn't even be interested in cases that are heavy in psychic connections. He's taking a completely different approach. Next. Now, his approach is based on, uh, when, when Von Lockerdeur looks at the progression of polygeist cases, this, it's kind of crudely similar to, I guess, uh, the kind of thing that you'd expect to happen in any kind of uh, mass experience. You get a big click and then you get a slow drop off and then it kind of fades into non-existence. Mm -hmm. And um, to me that's typical kind of uh, group behaviour uh, or um, when you get a, a series of incidents taking place, sure there will be a great big click at the beginning and then there will be a drop off. So to me there's nothing unusual about that. Uh, it's kind of typical kind of social behaviour. Um, but this is the focus in Goulet's book. He says that this book proposes an explanation, a better understanding of the phenomenon. It doesn't, in my judgment, but, but it's an interesting look, an interesting take. It proposes that UFOs are parapsychological phenomena. Now, one thing in my 30 or 40 years experience with the UFO phenomena is that there is a parapsychological aspect to the phenomenon, the UFO phenomenon, but it is not a parapsychological phenomenon in its own right. There is something quite substantial, something quite real, something physical, which has a parapsychological overlay in many cases. And certainly not in all cases, but in many, many cases. So you need to be able to understand that. Now, the argument quite often that's expressed within the UFO field is, is this a manifestation of a truly paranormal phenomenon, or is it a manifestation of something that we don't understand, like 
technology, some sort of superior technology. Arthur C. Clarke often used to say, any sufficiently advanced technology would appear like magic to us. Uh, and perhaps that's what we're seeing, some sort of intrusion of very advanced technology in which what we interpret as uh, paranormal or parapsychological phenomena is being interpreted by us with our kind of narrow lens as a parapsychological phenomenon. But it may well be that this advanced uh, sort of uh, situation that's operating in UFOs um, is already utilising that as almost as routine on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're interpreting it as something psychic and paranormal because we just don't understand it. Uh, so, next. And, and what Ulet does was he simply ignores any real physical aspect to the UFO phenomenon. The, according to him, there is no real physical evidence in the UFO field. Now, me, I'm trained in physical science, a chemist, that kind of stuff. I've been focusing and researching the physical aspects of the UFO phenomenon and the paranormal aspects of it for 30 or 40 years. To me, it is absolutely overwhelming that there is a real physical UFO phenomenon. I've looked at hundreds of UFO landing cases in Australia where there's quite clearly clear objective evidence of a physical reality to UFOs. Now, in itself, it might not prove that it's alien, but it's clearly real and absolutely real, but there are paranormal aspects to a lot of these cases. Now, and this is where Gillette almost lost me within the first chapter of his book, where he says that there is no real physical aspect to the UFO phenomenon. Now, the problem with Gillette is that he hasn't done any field research, and I'll seriously encourage him to do field research to actually expose himself directly to the UFO phenomenon if he can. And there are plenty of opportunities. A good friend of mine in Canada, where Gillette uh, lives, uh, Chris Latarski, has been researching. UFOs for decades, and I'm sure he'd be happy to take you left to a lot of interesting <coughs> place and counter cases which might assist him in trying to expand his view of what's going on in the UFO subject. Next. Now, as I said, Ulet really ignores the fact that there is a physical aspect. For me, the physical aspect of the UFO phenomenon is overwhelming and undeniable. Uh, but as I said, it doesn't prove that it's alien. It just proves that there's something real that needs to be dealt with. Um, and even the French government, uh, this classic case of Trenton province in January 1981, they spent years examining this one case. Now, for me, a person who's looked at hundreds of UFO landing cases with physical traces as a chemist, uh, this case, was the UFO encounter part of it was just a really straightforward, almost boringly uh, standard UFO landing case. And yet, what was really different and outstanding in this case is that the French government, through the French equivalent to NASA, uh, CNNES, uh, with the group that was developed called JPAN, which still exists in some form today, um, uh, looked at this case and applied all sorts of physical sciences to it and came up with some really interesting results. Um, and and to, even today, this case stands up fairly well. It, it, it appears that if one is able to have the resources and the money to apply to an average garden variety, literally it was next to the garden there in this encounter, so uh, an average garden variety UFO then, which I would see as pretty mundane and ordinary, um, an outstanding amount of data emerged from this. Now, that's applying real science to it now. If this was the average, and unfortunately it's not, it's far from the average because most cases of this nature uh, haven't had this degree of scientific analysis. Um, but if it was the standard... What's the real object, though? Did hmm? they find something actual? Well, they, they found um, uh, chemical differences, botanical differences in a ring, an annulus, that was left at the site. Basically, to cut a long story short, a uh, local guy Sees, hears this whirring noise, sees an object land on this pathway, little road pathway in front of his house. Um, he's within close proximity of it, then sees it take off, uh, sees uh, an annulus, a circular area, and then the gendarme or French local police called in. 
they paid soil samples, had soil samples were examined. Uh, it was a huge investigation. Um, now this case is not unique in shaping this investigation, but it's just an, an example of what can be done, which should be done, which isn't being done. Now I've, I've done chemistry on local cases as well, and, and others have helped me as well, and we've come up with some interesting anomalies, but nothing that proves that it's 100% alien, but certainly it, it does give support to the fact that something physically real is happening. Yes. Now I'll quickly rush through this. One of the bizarre things, I guess this comes from Ulet's sociological background, is that, and it's an aspect that um, von Lockerdu highlights as well, is that with this quantum entanglement aspect, he argues that there, there's almost like a symbolic overload aspect that comes out of it, and that you should be looking at the symbology behind close encounters. Well, that's all well and good, but if you're doing it that at the cost of looking at the, the clearly nuts and bolts or, or physical aspects of the phenomenon, for me, that I think is an error. Uh, and here, Dr. Ouellette's coming out with the symbolism of major UFO encounters from his perspective, purely from a sociological point of view. Somehow, the Washington DC sightings in 1952, which were quite dramatic, involved radar correlations of objects that passed over Washington DC. Somehow that had something to do with the Democratic Convention going on in the, in the same week. Uh, the classic 1989-91 Belgian encounter, which included radar visual cases, that kind of thing, uh, jet aircraft pursuits, somehow that had something to do with the uh, the NATO star, this big statue that's out front of NATO headquarters in Belgium. Don't ask me what the connection is, but somehow this is much more important than the physical aspects of the UFO case. Um, the classic Rendlesham Forest case in 1980, uh, which involved uh, US um, uh, personnel having close encounters with an object that apparently landed in Rendlesham Forest right next door to a major nuclear base. Um, uh, somehow that had something to do with the Britain Common uh, protest peace quilt that was knitted three years later, according to Ulet. <laughs> Don't ask me what the relevance of it is, but somehow Ulet comes up with that connection. Mainly because the quilt seemed to show some similarity between a sketch that was done by Sergeant Jim Peniston in his place encounter where he was so close to the object he, he, he put his hand on it, had some sort of uh, sort of consciousness kind of uh, implosion kind of thing or explosion, whatever you want. It was a, a really bizarre encounter. He claims he touched it. He also noted that there was these symbols on the side of the object. It was so close, he could write down in, in his notebook these strange symbols. Now, these symbols seem to have a, a vague approximation to patterns that appear on this piece quilt three years later. Somehow that's relevant according to Dr. Ouellet. Now, to me, uh, that is kind of, well, I shouldn't be sure of toilet, but cool. I, think, I think it's silly. It, it doesn't make sense. Now, it goes right overboard in 1961, the one classic encounter of Betty and Barney Hill, this famous alien abduction case, popularised in a book called The Interrupted Journey in 1966. Now, there, Ouellet is drawing connection to the appearance of the UFO Somehow that's connected to the appearance of the freedom ride buses that were used in the uh, uh, protest um, peace marches and uh, the um, freedom rides that were being conducted during that year of 1961 and in the next few years. And somehow, if you invert the appearance of the grey alien that he does here, it has some sort of same, sim sort of vague symbolic correlation to the appearance of the Ku Klux Klan uh, classic hood. Now, to me, this vague symbolism is absurd. It's kind of interesting, I suppose, but it doesn't have much relevance to the clear aspects. Now, in the Betty and Barney Hill case, there was this classic uh, star map that Betty Hill claims she saw on board the UFO. Well, that correlates that with a map that shows the pathways that the Freedom Buses took during 1961. Now, he claims that that's a better correlation to the Betty Hill star map than other work that was done. Now, to me, 
uh, again, I'll, I'll be frank about it, to me it's, it's silly, it's stupid, it, it, it just doesn't fit. Um, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, you can make your own minds up, but I just thought if this is an interesting model that he's put forward, but the application of it in the UFO field just doesn't stand up very well. Next. Now, how does the UFO research field um, sort of respond to it? Now, my friend Jerry Clark, I read to you his reaction to his own book that Ulet uses as a model and, and uh, extends Jerry's work. This is Jerry's review, and I'll just go through it. Uh, he says everything comes around eventually, and here we have a case of note the right revival of a largely forgotten obsession of 70s ufology. I know it well. In 1975, Warren Coleman and I wrote a book, The Unidentified, which captured the spirit of the era, Jungian theories and parapsychological UFOs. Coleman and I soon moved on, relegating the book to youthful excess and barrister report. Curiously, it still has its defenders, amongst them the author of Illuminations, Eric Goulet, Canadian professor of defence studies and an active parapsychologist. In short, not much is new here. Macro PK, or psychokinesis, creates UFOs, and experiences of them are symbolic, generated in response to social stresses. This hypothesis, if that's the word for it, persuades no more now than four decades ago when it passed out of fashion. Some of the original advocates woke up one morning with a terrifying realisation. Their rejection of extraterrestrial UFOs would not render them socially respectable if at the same time they advocated for something just as heretical, namely psychic phenomena. In a bleep or two, they were promoting the so-called Social, psychosocial hypothesis, shiny, fresh, minted moniker for a rusty old fashioned debunkery. Some of us, on the other hand, turned to scepticism of sweeping explanatory approaches, both those with that dismissed and, 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 and those that embraced. After, after all this time, I'm modestly confident that UFOs do not constitute a single anomaly. I wonder if um, we have gone to a lot of unnecessary trouble because we keep trying to cram them into one box, as Dr. Ulet hardly alone essentially has done here. It would also help if we stopped dragging in creepy con uh, concepts such as macro PK. Um, on its best days, a hugely speculative notion to explain anything. If we keep social stresses out of it too, now there's always social stresses, and certainly in these days there's a lot of social stress. Uh, and there is no empirically demonstrated reason to link them to UFO sighting. If there was such a link, the Middle East would be so thick with UFOs that all concern would be distracted from what they're doing now, that killing each other, um, from, uh, and the pursuit of ceaseless bloody conflict. But that's not happening. There, there are no overwhelming UFO sightings going on in the Middle East. There, there are some UFO sightings, but clearly uh, nowhere as prolific as happening in areas where we don't have day-to-day -day concerns about survival like they are having in the Middle East. So if, it, if social stress and symbolic patterns were really a key part of the UFO phenomenon, as Jerry Clark suggests, uh, the Middle East would be besieged by UFO sightings. They're not. Uh, next. Um, basically, uh, this next review is hardly, you wouldn't think you'd get common ground, but this is written by Peter Rogerson, who's one of the key uh, proponents of the psychosocial hypothesis, and that pretty much is what where Ulet is sitting at, and that is that UFOs have no physical presence. Uh, UFOs are us. UFOs are created by us. That's Ulet's hypothesis. And here's one of the major proponents of the parapsychological theory uh, dismissing the illuminations as being so, I don't know, just a, a relic of the, the 1970s. Uh, in, in effect, he's saying his hypothesis is that true UFOs are manifestations of human psychokinesis rather than um, mega poltergeist. He draws his theories on the theories of Walter von Lockerdu, who talks about the social dimensions of poltergeist cases, um, and then throws in a little bit of Jungian theory, throws in um, Shell Blake's ideas of more resonance, all that kind of stuff, creates this strange view and then tries to apply it to the UFO phenomenon and ignores all the critical aspects of the UFO phenomenon, i.e. the physical nature of it. Uh, 
uh, and clearly it's enamored by Jung and, and um, Jacques Vallée's theories and uh, that kind of thing. The real trouble with Ouellette's hypothesis is that while we know human beings exist, we certainly don't know that psychokinesis or morphic fields or other psi processes exist. We think we do, but we haven't proved them absolutely. They are simply speculations in both to explain a variety of anomalous experiences. This is uh, Peter Rogers' mistake. But we do know that human beings exist. exist. Indeed, we can reinterpret Ouellette's scenarios in psychosocial terms. So he drags it back to Ouellette. Ouellette's theories really are a, a basically a, a rebadging of the so-called psychosocial hypothesis that says that there's nothing real to UFO. It's all human creation. And next. Oops. Yep, I will. Yeah. So, okay, so basically, just to wrap it up, you can get my opinion on what I think of the next book. It's an interesting kind of exposure to uh, a theory or something, but it doesn't prove anything. In fact, it tends to dilute the significance of the real world at that time. Um, and rather, one thing that Ulrich does not highlight is that the parapsychological field has already done some preliminary testing of um, von Bockadu's theory, and even though it's not exactly the best of tests, uh, it didn't prove anything. It basically highlighted that uh, the testing of von Bockadu's hypothesis, and this is the model of pragmatic information, uh, its predictions that von Bockadu provided weren't verified in the testing today. So uh, even within the parapsychological field, it's been suggested that one might do his theory that that um, well, that is usually hasn't been proven. Um, and there are many cases, even in Canada, uh, where Ulek should go out and examine them. Cases that are rich in UFOs, films, paranormal cases, that kind of stuff, that where he could do a bit of field work and maybe modify his viewpoints and do his research. Um, these are cases that even people like Dr. Adam Heine looked at back in the 70s. Um, so, are parapsychology and UFOs and ufology compatible? Absolutely. Each has much to offer each other. Each are fertile domains for each other. And, but the problem is you need to avoid extreme and conservative in the box approaches. And hypotheses that are put up, the theories that are put up, need to be backed up with evidence and need to examine the nature of what's really going on rather than totally ignoring the more substantial aspects of the subject. Um, but I won't, I won't go and burden you with a lot of cases, but you know the kind of cases I'm looking at, cases that I look at all the time, if you're about any cases, uh, high quality physical evidence cases, that kind of thing. These are the kind of things that need to be explained. But all of those have paranormal dimensions to them as well at the time. So um, there's definitely, as I said, a paranormal uh, aspect to the UFO phenomenon. But it is not the be all and end all of the UFO phenomenon. There's something real going on that needs to be explained as well. Okay. Thanks very much.